Hello, everyone. I'm Kelly Eversole, the Executive Director of the International Wheat Genome Sequencing Consortium. And I'm very pleased to welcome you today to our webinar. We are fortunate to have Yasser Garafi from Totori University in Japan with us today, and he will be giving us a presentation regarding the exploration of wild relatives diversity. But before we start the webinar, I'm going to give you a quick overview of the IWGSC. So we are an international public-private consortium with members in 3,400 or more than 3,400 members in 72 countries. And we have over 900 institutes and companies that are in, engaged with us in some manner and have been for since our founding a number of years ago. We also have 10 sponsors, and I would like to thank all of our sponsors right now because they make it possible for us to do the webinar and also to uh, coordinate activities globally. Our vision since the publication of the reference sequence has been to continue to work to enhance breeding through an increased understanding of the molecular basis of traits and their allelic diversity. Of course, it goes without saying that one of the reasons we want to do that is because we want to improve wheat. And that's why we're fortunate today to have Yasser Garafi with us because he'll be talking with us about how we can increase the diversity within wheat and link that to uh, traits. So our next webinar will be uh, in September. We're about to go on our on our uh, summer break, and I would uh, encourage you to join us uh, for that to hear about uh, the genome sequence of a French wheat variety, Renon, uh, and it was done with uh, Oxford Nanopore. So it's kind of an interesting technology and unusual. So it should be a great webinar. Uh, just to remind you, the webinar is being recorded and will be posted on the IWGSC YouTube channel in a few days. You can subscribe to the channel so you see every video as it's uploaded. The presentation will be followed by a Q&A session. Please put your questions in the Q&A panel, uh, but also monitor the chat panel to see messages from us. Uh, which may include links to papers or websites that are mentioned during the presentation. Already, you can download the handouts uh, from the presentation in the handout panel. So without further ado, I'd like to again welcome Yasser Garafi, who is a professor at Totori University in Japan. And he will be speaking with us about the extensive exploration of wild relatives diversity for wheat breeding from the gene bank to the field. Yasser, thank you very much for being with us. And I look forward to hearing your webinar. Thank you very much. I hope that uh, you can hear me, my voice is clear and the slides in a good shape? Yes, okay? we're, we're all good. Okay, thank you very much. And thank you for giving me this opportunity to share with you the work we are doing here in Arid Land Research Center in Total University. And actually, this is represents the activities of the Molecular Breeding Laboratory at the Arid Land Research Center of Totori University. That means I am just one of the one member of the of the of the of the, of the team of, of the laboratory. Uh, the contents of my talk today will be a brief background about uh, the start of, of, of this work and our activities in hexaploid wheat. We are going to explain somewhat about the population we developed and how we evaluated, and then also the activities on tetraploid wheat. And we talk about the population we developed and also the, the evaluation and some ongoing uh, activities. So at the beginning, I would like to start with the evolution of wheat. We know that the evolution of bread wheat started a long time ago with the hybridization between tetraploid wheat with AA and BB genome with a D genome progenitor deployed to species Europe, Europe so shy. And this uh, hybridization 
uh, resulted in the Triticum estival, the bread wheat we know now, and we are, we are consuming. And this, uh, actually, this hybridization uh, involved few events. That mean only few originators were involved in this uh, hybridization. And now we can repeat the story again, and we can resynthesize the, the bread wheat again by crossing the tetraploid wheat with the gilostoshite, the genome donor, the genome originator. And we can develop what we call this synthetic uh, wheat. And this uh, scheme is really very useful to widen the uh, neurogenetic diversity of bread wheat that we can produce more germoblast from triticum, uh, from tetraploid or from uh, diploid species. The Eulopsodoshai has a very wide diversity, has three lineages, lineage one, this is distributed in all the species range, and lineage two is uh, limited to this area of the species range, and lineage three is very small uh, place here in Georgia. And Eulopsodoshai has a very wide diversity, and it is reported that it has a very great potential to widen the neurogenetic uh, diversity of bread wheat. And here, this is just a part, picture from the field, you can see how this uh, uh, Europe Social has a very wide diversity with, and how it can support this, poten this potential diversity can be used to widen the neurogenetic diversity of credit. The start of, of this work was a small study or a study conducted to explore the potentiality of Europe Social for uh, drought. Uh, drought tolerance, breeding of hexaploid wheat. And in this study, uh, 33 Eulopsoshia accession were used in addition to their corresponding synthetic wheat lines. That's the synthetic wheat lines produced from this 33 Eulopsoshia. And the tetraploid background was uh, cultivar langdon. And during the course of this study, or the output from this study, we found that there was no correlation between the diploid species or uh, Eulopsoshia and the corresponding synthetic wheat. The absence of this correlation means that Regardless of the uh, means that regardless of the Europe social adaptation, uh, the synthetic wheat can possess desired traits. But even if the Europe social is tolerant, you found that the synthetic wheat is not tolerant. If the, uh, to the Europe social is sensitive, you can find that some synthetic wheat are possessing uh, very good phenotypes under under drought stress condition. And this led us to think that maybe we don't need to evaluate the Europe social. We just need to produce the synthetic wheat, and then we can evaluate the synthetic wheat and select the tolerant or the desired lines from this uh, from this process. But the synthetic wheat has a problem that is, it's agronomically very poor, and it is very difficult to evaluate it phenotypically in the field like the normal wheat. So maybe the best option is that is to uh, dilute the white alleles or the white uh, trace of the synthetic wheat by crossing with uh, elite wheat uh, varieties or elite wheat uh, germoplasma. So the other question came is that if we follow this, we have to generate the synthetic wheat, or if we need to cross the synthetic wheat with, uh, with elite cultivars and then evaluate the progenies, we cannot use all this diversity. So the idea was how to introduce all much of the diversity presented in Gilopstoshia into wheat. In a very simple way or practical way, if it is possible to say. And also at the same time, if we would like to compare the impact of different gilops to share accessions, how it can be achieved? Because now we have a lot of uh, synthetic weeds, and maybe in uh, some of the germoplasts, they are they don't have like a uniform background. The background usually is very is different from other cultivars, and we cannot compare clearly to see the, the effect of the gilops to share. So, uh, for example, now here this is. Uh, Proposed scheme or what we what we did. For example, usually we the ordinary way is to cross the elite uh, cultivars. For example, here we have Japanese cultivar Norin 61 with synthetic wheat, and we produce the uh, synthetic wheat derivatives. But this involves only one cross. So if we would like to expand and if we would like to capture most diversity, we, 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 we propose that. And instead of crossing only one synthetic wheat line, we can cross many of the synthetic lines with a practical cultivar, uh, Eglobstoshai. We can cross many synthetics with uh, Eglobstoshai. 
and we come back across again to dilute the effect of the wild wild alleles. So what we did simply is that we crossed and we back crossed once with Nurin 61. And from each cross, we selected 10 plants from each BC1F1, BC1F1 generation. Then from each one plant, we had 10 seeds. That means we selected 100 seeds from each cross. And actually, we used 43 different synthetic lines. That means if we multiply 100 by 43, that means we have 4,300 lines. And then we mixed all these seeds together. We generated mixture population that uh, had genomes from Norin 61 percentage is 75 percent and 25 percent from Europe. So theoretically, this is from one back course event. And we mixed all this population. We created mixture of 4,300 lines. Why we did that? Because we feel that it is uh, the, the process itself was not very difficult. Many few people were involved in this work. So it was not difficult to produce. But handling of 43 different populations with large number of individuals was very difficult and challenging. So maybe it is the good option is to maintain all this material as bulk because it will be very easy to handle. And the objective was also was only to dilute the effect of the, introduce the diversity, dilute the effect of the wild traits, and at the same time provide materials that can be good to, to select for, for, for different purposes. So this was the idea. And uh, to, 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 to validate this idea and to validate this population, of course, the, the advances in genome, yeah, in genotyping and genome sequencing were very useful. Had to take uh, advantage of this uh, very nice tool. So we can select it randomly 400 lines from this uh, 4,300, and we genotype these lines with uh, dart check genotyping, which is provided like steep markers and silico dart markers. And we could easily, by the DNA markers, based on the D-genome markers, we could easily identify the pedigree of the 400 MSD lines. And here we used a set of four synthetic lines that were not involved in the basic process. So we could assign each individual in this population to the uh, synthetic, uh, synthetic weed parents, and we could verify the pedigree of each line. So even with mixing of this uh, material, to ease the handling and this kind of, of things, it is very easy also to, to find the pedigree and identify the pedigree and identify the elops of shy donor and also the synthetic, uh, so the synthetic donors. And here this graph shows a graphical genotyping of two families, family 26 and family 32. This is the biggest two families within the 400 lines. And here you can see clearly the blue line represents the genome of Norin 61. And, uh, yellow line or yellow color represents the genome of the synthetic wheat. And here you can see that the MSD individuals uh, incorporate the D genome of the Toshai within the background of the cultivar Nurin 61. And we applied genome mitosogen analysis to see the feasibility or applicability of this population to conduct such kind of genetic analysis. And we could find very promising results that we identified uh, for the uh, heading time uh, QTL that correspond to the, for the, uh, for the period gene, PBDD1, and also for groom coloration, the same with is the reported uh, gene that already uh, identified also within, within the population. And this results really show that this population can be also used to conduct genome-wide association analysis or to conduct genetic analysis. So with this promising findings, we started our work and we started to evaluate this material. The first uh, start was in, in Sudan. Sudan is known to be the hottest weed growing environment for, uh, for irrigated uh, uh, wheat. And in Sudan, uh, there is a very nice gradient in temperature from the north to the south that can allow very uh, nice uh, phenotyping with different doses of the stress. For example, here Dongola, this is the coolest place with average temperature of 29, coming to Hedeiba, here is relatively hot, with uh, average of 31 to 32 degrees. Coming to the Gezira, this is the biggest irrigated uh, scheme of Sudan, and the temperature, uh, average temperature up to 235. 
For example, here, this is the maximum temperature during the growing season in different locations. MED is what Madan is, what is region. You see it is having a very high temperature at the beginning of the season, at the end of the season. But it is intermediate and don't is a cooler environment. We collected several, uh, several uh, parameters or several uh, data, physiological data and uh, yield, yield component data. And here, this graph shows the relationship between the heat tolerance efficiency. This is uh, tolerance index and the grain yield at Dongola. This is a, represent, for example, the, pot the potential or the uh, favorable environment. And uh, you can see that here, this is Nurin 61. This is the background of the population. There is the recurrent parent of the population here. This is Imam and this is Gumbria. These two adapted Sudanese varieties. We can see that we have some lines that are showing better tolerance than the recurrent parent Nurin 61. And some of them also showing better tolerance to heat stress uh, than even the Imam and, and, and Bumri. And the second study, also we evaluated this population under uh, combined heat salinity. In Hudayba, in Sudan, there is heat stress, as I said. It is uh, minimum average temperature is about 30 to 31 during the growing season. But some areas of Hudayba are affected by salt. So we evaluated this population under combined heat salinity stress for two seasons, 16, 17, 17, 18. And uh, we, here we used 247 MSD lines, uh, Nurin 61 Imam and Gumbria. And here, this is the maximum temperature during the two seasons. You can see here that the first season, during the first season, for example, during the vegetative growth, the first season was hotter than the second season while during heading and grain filling, it was the opposite, that the first season was cooler than the second season. Also, in the first season, the salinity in the field was 4.9 dcm, and uh, the second season was 3.6. This is very slight salinity, and this field selected based on the previous experiments that conducted in this station. Usually, if you go to high salinity soil with the effect of heat stress, you cannot get any, any, any data. So we had to... Uh, stick to evaluate under soil with very mild salinity or with not, uh, without very high salt concentration. And uh, based on the different traits, because here we don't have control, so we couldn't grow the experiment under the non-saline uh, condition because the timing is really very difficult, very costly, and the experiment is very big. And because it is salinity also, we had to increase the number of applications. We use here uh, four applications. So the evaluation was conducted only under combined heat salinity. So our evaluation or uh, method to identify the tolerance or good germplasma is based on the integrated score. In this integrated score, we uh, used Nurin 61 as a, as a, as a control or the, or the reference, and the, uh, evaluated the, the trace of the of, 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 uh, of the MSD of the, of the MSD lines. And uh, we used here several traits, except heading and maturity, because they didn't show good correlation with the grain yield under, under FEDEC condition. And in the first season, we could identify 30 tolerant lines, and the second season, 16 lines. And uh, in both seasons, consistently, there is five lines that possess better performance than Nurin 61. Interestingly, uh, this out of, of, uh, of the five lines, four, we are derivatives of one only one accession of Egelopstoshai. And uh, by checking the passport data of this uh, accession, we found that it is collected from Iran, in Hamadan area. And this is here the salinity map of Iran. You see the area uh, from which this accession was obtained is affected by, 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 some, by, by some salt in, uh, by, 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 by salinity. And another point is that. Uh, these uh, 36 tolerant lines are coming from descendants of 20 different Egelopstoshii parents. And we have eight tolerant lines in season one where sister lines to eight tolerant lines in season two. That means maybe the evaluation or the, the results is, uh, uh, have a, uh, these good results and it is promising. And then we selected randomly one of the tolerant lines and we conducted the experiment here in the lysometer in the Arid Land Research Center to just to validate if the results is correct or not. And here you can see this is Nurin 61 growing in lysometer. We are irrigated by saline water. And here this is a tolerant or potentially tolerant MSD lines. See the difference is very clear in the performance of the two of the two lines. 
Also, we conduct the genome-wide association and laser we can identify that 22 consistent market thread associations in both regions. And then we continue and we evaluated the population again, but this time under uh, combined heat and drought condition. And this experiment was conducted in Gezira. This is a field, uh, our field in the Gezira in Sudan. And here, this is a drought plots. And you can see this picture here, we uh, installed sensor to measure the soil water potential, then to control the irrigation in the drought plots. And uh, we used only 145 MSD lines with five checks, and the experiment was for two duplication, and the drought was imposed as a post-flowering drought treatment. In the first season 2019 and second season 2020, this shows the temperature during the two seasons. Maybe the first season was hotter than the second season. And uh, here, this is the measurement of the soil water potential. But, uh, in, the, in both seasons, at around minus 900 kilopascal, we had to rewater the field again to avoid uh, permanent building of the, of, of the crop. So we rewatered once after we stopped the irrigation after the, after the flowering. And then we continued with the drought treatment again up to the end of the, of, of the complete maturity of the, of the crop. And we collected also data on various morphological traits and yield yield components and some physiological traits, including uh, delta carbon 30. And here, this graph show the relationship between the mean grain yield under heat condition and the mean grain yield under heat and drought, uh, drought condition. And you can see clearly here, this is Imam, the adapted Sudanese cultivar, and this is Rolf. Rolf is a drought tolerant check. And you can see that there is some uh, lines from the MSD possessing better performance than the adapted cultivar or than the drought uh, checks. And also here, this is a stability uh, analysis of the, of the lines in the four different environments. And here, this histogram is summarizing the results of the stability index. Here, this is a position of Noreen 61, the recurrent parent of the population. Here, this is a position of Imam. And here, you can see that we have some lines showing better stability under, uh, under the, the conditions of the heat and combined heat droughts and the, the recurrent parent or, or than the adapted Sudanese cultivar. And also, we could identify several you know, uh, marker trait associations under heat and heat drought conditions. And some uh, stable markers under uh, that identified under both heat and combined heat drought. And their alleles also derived, for example, here some alleles derived from the tetraploid wheat or the tetraploid parent of the population that is associated with the grain yield. And uh, some alleles or uh, positive alleles uh, identified also for grain yield that were derived from the yellow stop shy parents, in this case, for example, chromosome 60D. And also, there is some alleles that also contribute to increase the uh, uh, plant height that also derived from, from Iglops. And uh, because also another aspect in wheat is very important is uh, grain quality. We also try to, to see the variation for uh, end use quality within uh, the panel of the MST, of MST lines. And because also this material has been evaluated under heat and combined heat drought and also under several stresses, and also here in Japan, we grow the material under optimum condition. This gives us also opportunity to see if we can find or identify potential germplasm that can be good to improve the end use quality of, of wheat under stress condition, because this is also hot topic and hot area. And also, uh, germplasm that can possess better end use quality is required. So from the same experiments that we grow for heat and heat drought condition, we obtain the seeds from Sudan, and we have another set of, uh, another experiment also was grown here in Japan, comparing the optimum condition, this is Japan, heat and heat drought condition in Sudan, and we studied uh, the seed shape related traits with the smart grain software and also the seed hardiness. Seed hardiness is very important trait for the, for the wheat and use quality. And for example, here, this uh, picture shows a variation in kernel weight and shape related traits among Noreen 61, the background, imams, check cultivar, and some MSD lines. And uh, during our analysis, we identified that the MSD 187 is a tolerant line, 
and this time showing very slight reduction in seed size and seed weight under the heat and heat drought condition compared to Norin 61 and also the sensitive or uh, sensitive line MSD 259 showing that very small seeds under heat and combined heat drought condition compared to MSD 1887. And here we measure the hardiness for the for the population under the three conditions. See that with the uh, with, the, with the, uh, there is a good uh, variation in the hardness within the population, and there is tendency to increase the uh, hardness is increased under the stress uh, conditions. That uh, that means the uh, seed texture uh, shifted from being soft, for example, in case of Norin 61, to be more harder due to heat and combined heat drought. And to identify that uh, germplasm that can maintain good hardiness or stable hardiness. Under the stress condition, we calculated the hardiness index. And here we can see that uh, Norin 61 moved from being uh, soft to become more harder. But still, there is some MSD line that can show that they can maintain good hardiness or they can maintain their hardiness or they show just a slight change in the hardiness and due to heat and the heat drought uh, condition. And because the uh, hardiness was highly correlated with the kernel weight, and the kernel weight is one of the traits that contribute to the final grain yield. We just investigated the relationship between the heat susceptibility index or the uh, heat, heat tolerance and also the tolerance in kernel weight. That means we can select for both stable uh, hardness and stable kernel weight. And we could identify again that the MSD9187 showing good performance and MSD259 showing uh, sensitivity. That's a very great big change in the hardiness and also high reduction in kernel weight. And here, this is also under heat drought, uh, combined heat drought condition. The same, we also identified, selected MSD187 as a tolerant and MSD259 as, as a sensitive. And to understand why 187 was tolerant and why 259 was sensitive and showing big change in the, in the hardness, we use the electron microscope to get sections from the seeds from different conditions, optimum heat and heat drought. Here, this is Imam, this is Norin 61, this is MSD 187 and MSD 259. If you see that uh, MSD 259 under optimum conditions, there was a clear separation between the protein matrix and the starch granules. And this is also the case of MSD 187 and the other uh, Norin 61. But in case of Imam, because it is already hard, uh, hard type uh, wheat, spring wheat, there is no clear separation between the uh, starch granules and the protein matrix. The starch granules is embedded in kind inside the uh, protein matrix. And imam changed to be more harder under heat, more and more harder under heat drought uh, condition. In case of Nurin 61, when it is uh, subjected to heat, the, uh, the starch granules started to be embedded inside the protein matrix and under heat drought condition, there is the starch granules totally embedded in the uh, protein matrix and the texture became, became harder, more harder. And this is also the case of MSD259 uh, changed from soft to hard. But in case of MSD187, even under heat and heat drought condition is still maintained the, the, the seed texture and the starch granules were well separated from the uh, protein matrix. And using the mar uh, association analysis and association mapping analysis, we could identify market trade associated with the, the seed hardiness. For example, in chromosome 5D and chromosome 6D, chromosome 5D it is reported that the genes that are controlling the seed hardiness in wheat being A and being B are located. But we found another association in a region uh, close to the uh, being A and being B positions. And also, we found some uh, other marker threat associations in chromosome 4D that contribute to the hardness index under heat and heat drought conditions. That means these markers also contribute to the stabilization of the hardness under uh, heat stress condition. This is really very potential results. Maybe if it validated, maybe it can contribute to production of more uh, wheat lines that can maintain stable uh, seed hardiness under stress conditions. And also we studied the glutenin allele subunits 
constitution of these uh, combinations in the, in, in the MSD lines. And now we are studying the DOF strengths and other uh, induced quality or bread making quality parameters. And in summary, we can say that the MSD that includes 43, a diversity of 43 different yellow stochiae. And the good point is that it has a uniform A and B genetic background because A and B is coming from Nurin 61, 75%, and 25% from the tetraploid beat tandem. That means we have a little bit relatively uniform A and B genetic background that can allow us to easily see the effect of the yellow stochiae uh, genome. And uh, this approach or the MSD platform could be very efficient in mobilizing genetic diversity from the gene bank to the field because it is include 43 uh, diverse of 43 different eagle to shy accessions. And it was a good option to, to explore and utilize the genetic variation of eagle of shy in short time and maybe more practical, less expensive way because the uh, production of the population itself was very easy. And it could be uh, considered as a good resource for with breeding, QT analysis, and gene identification. And also for us, as I said, it was easy to see the impact of uh, different eagle of shy accessions. And maybe the increasing of our crossing rate in MSD is essential to maximize the diversity and also to increase the recombination uh, rate, which can also improve the resolution of identifying the new alleles or QDNs. Now we have other ongoing activities that uh, phenotyping under heat, phosphorus deficiency condition, and also under heat and nitrogen deficiency conditions. And also our, some of our lab members are conducting metabolome analysis in some selected lines after validation of their tolerance to identify them make physiological mechanisms that behind the tolerance of these lines. And also we developed a set of recombinant embed lines for validation of our market period association results. So with this uh, work in uh, wheat, we repeated the same in tetraploid wheat. And in case of tetraploid wheat, we crossed nine wide emer wheat accessions from the two lineage, central eastern lineage and western lineage with a uh, durum wheat cultivar, practically mix three, which is very famous in Mediterranean areas like, for example, Lebanon and Syria. And uh, following the same scheme of, uh, of the MST, we cross the nine, emer, nine uh, wild emer wheat with uh, mix three and produce a mixture of 900 lines that uh, theoretically have 75% from mix three and 25% from wild emer wheat. And also we could identify the pedigree of some selected lines. In this case, we studied 178 MDL lines and with, uh, after genotyping with dart sec markers, and we put some Sudanese cultivars here as checks, we could identify the, the pedigree of the MDL lines in, uh, in this uh, population. And here this PCA analysis is showing the diversity within the MSD, uh, MDL lines here. This is the nine wide emer wheat accessions. And here, this is a Sudanese cultivar, including uh, mix three. And you can see that the MDL lines are positioned in between the Sudanese cultivars or between mix three and the treating uh, uh, the, uh, the, the wild emer wheat. And maybe we can say here that the MDL lines captured diversity from, from wild emer wheat. And it can, we can say that it is now bridged the gap between the wild emer wheat and the elite uh, germplasm. So these MDL lines also were phenotyped in Sudan in two locations, in Dungula, in Jazeera, in Wad Medani. This represents a cooler region. This is a hot region in Sudan. And uh, also another set of experiments was grown here in Japan, in Totori. This represents the optimum condition. And uh, in Sudan, also in Gezira, it was the experiment was grown in two sowing dates, optimum sowing date and also late sowing date. This is generate another environment. So in total, it is four environments, and also we measure the morphological, physiological yield and yield component rates. And here, this is shows the relationship between the grain yield that would made any first sowing date, the optimum sowing date, and the late sowing date in would made any. And here, this is the position of mix three the recurrent period of the population. And you can see that there is some line showing better performance than mix 3 under the optimum sowing date and also under the dead sowing date. 
And also we conducted genome-wide association analysis, and we could identify market period associations for different traits within the uh, MDL lines. And uh, also we could identify some alleles for contribute to increase the grain yield. And this is just showing the relationship or the effect of different grain yield allele combinations identified in this in this population. And interestingly, we could identify that some of the MTAs identified in this population were absent completely in the set of the elite uh, urine wheat lines were, were also genotyped with, with the MDL lines. And we found that the positive alleles coming from the wild emer wheat were completely absent in the in the in the in the, in the Lead urine with accessions. We use about 50 accessions as uh, as control as, che as checks, and we found that the uh, MTAs identified were originated from the white emer wheat were absent in the in the elite uh, urine wheat lines uh, studied. And uh, we can say that like the MSD, the MDL was also effective in harnessing the white emer wheat alleles to improve the tetraploid wheat. And uh, uh, in summary, I would like to say that maybe both MDL and uh, MSD were efficient in mobilizing the diversity from the gene bank and bring it to the field. And maybe combining the diversity of MSD and MDL will provide interesting endoplasm. Now we are making crosses between some selected MSD lines and some MDL lines creating pentaploids. And the idea is to uh, gender and is to maximize the diversity in the A and B genome of the MSD lines, also to also introduce uh, new diversity in the A and B genome of the MDL lines. And we back cross this pentaploid with hexaploid with back uh, again. And maybe we can get new interesting germ as having more diversity. And now with, uh, with the advances in the technologies and uh, Phenotyping and, and also in the speed breeding and genomic selection, maybe these tools is going to provide better resolution and enable dissecting the tolerant traits and also maybe provide better opportunities to explore this material and get more precise results. Uh, maybe at the end, I would like just to say that we are located here in Totori in Japan, facing the Japan Sea. We have a very cold winter. And also we have annual rainfall above 1,000 millimeter, and we have no stress. But our work was concentrating on heat and drought and salinity. And I would like to say that this was possible because we have very strong and robust collaboration with the wheat research program of the Agriculture Research Corporation of Sudan. And uh, at the end, I would like, on behalf of my laboratory members, I would like to say is thank you very much for giving us this opportunity to share with you some of the activities now we are working on and also to listening to us today. And uh, here you can find the links to the Institute, the Aridan Research Center, to our laboratory, and also to our small gene bank that we are having here in the, in the center, and also the website to our project, collaborative research project between our center and also the ARC of Sudan with. And if you have any questions, if you need to have uh, materials or are interested to use these materials, please don't hesitate to contact me or Professor Hisayo Sujimu to the head of the laboratory. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Yasser, for a very interesting presentation. So just a reminder, you can put your questions into the Q&A panel and we'll get started with that immediately. Um, the first question comes from Dan Smith. Uh, did you identify any promising physiological, uh, in parentheses, ideotype, in parentheses, changes correlated with good heat or heat plus drought resistance in your synthetic lines? Can you repeat again? I couldn't have your question clearly. What did was the question? You, yeah. Did you identify any promising physiological ideotype changes correlated with good heat or heat plus drought resistance in your synthetic lines? Yes, there is. So there is some promising physiological idiotypes, and there are some physiological changes correlated with good uh, with uh, 
yes, with, with the heat and drought tolerance. For example, there was a good correlation with the canopy temperature, and also there was also correlation with the uh, with, uh, carbon, carbon isotope discrimination. Although it is really very difficult to measure the carbon isotope discrimination, but there was a correlation with canopy temperature. Yes. Yeah. So, just out of curiosity, for those or what are you do? Are you taking them forward and for other research or? Yes, they are going to other research, and uh, uh, now uh, there are some experiments that are being conducted here in the Arid Land Research Center. We are using gross uh, chambers, and mm -hmm. we are imposing the drought and the heat, and we are conducting metabolome analysis and, and uh, more precise physiological phenotyping, including photosynthesis rate, stomatal conductance, and other physiological parameters. We would like just to see or to elucidate the mechanism of the tolerance of these lines. Did, um, so and the, the next question coming from Mohammed Ali Sher, uh, did you give heat stress at specific growth stages or throughout the crop growth phases? Okay, this question is interesting. For example, if you go back here to the You can see here, this is a trend of the temperature during the growing season. In West Medani, for example, you see the maximum temperature during the vegetative growth was above 35 for several weeks. And also during uh, grain filling and heading was a little bit cooler in this season, but it started to raise again. So in Sudan, usually you can consider that wheat is growing under continuous heat stress. But we have studies here now in the gross chambers we are imposing the heat stress at different physiological stages and we are seeing the effect or the response of the different lines yes and if you go but if you go to our laboratory website you can find that we have some publications that of evaluation under heat stress and also metabolome analysis under heat and as well as under drought conditions but okay. in the field the heat was under the, we can say that we are under continuous heat stress. Mm. Great. So the next question comes from Ziwai Shen. Um, I hope, forgive me if I mispronounced the name. Um, the salt in the soil changes frequently. So what is the criteria for measuring the electrical conductivity for evaluating the salt stress of the soil? Actually, Yes, this is a good question because we, we depend on measuring the, soil, the electrical conductivity using a uh, sensor. We are measuring in each plot. We have 1,000 plots for the experiment. We measure the salinity within the field uh, three times during the course of the experiment. And we are reporting the data. And this was used also for the phenotypic data analysis. So we are using like, uh, sensor to measure the salinity, the electric conductivity in the field. We measure the under in each plot. I think if this if I can if, if this maybe this is the answer or if you have if we need more clarification or something if you don't know. Okay, I'm sorry. I'm going to take over from Kelly. She had to, to step out uh, for, for a minute. So the um, uh, question is, do you have plans to develop multiple deri derivative lines for exaploid wheat? Please, can you repeat the question again? Okay. Do you have plans to develop multiple derivative lines for exaploid wheat? We developed already the MSDs with uh, multiple derivative lines for the hexaploid wheat. The MSD is the hexaploid wheat, and the MDL are tetraploid wheat. Ah, okay. We started first okay. with, uh, with the MSD, with the hexaploid wheat, and when it was working nice, we also conducted and uh, repeated the same in the, in the tetraploid wheat. But how do you take it now back? So thank you, Isabel, for stepping in for me. How do you now take it back? So you've done your the research in um, Tauschai and in tetraploid wheat. Now, how do you integrate that back into hexatoid? Now we are crossing the, the MDL with the hexaploid wheat. 
you are trying to because the hexaploid with the background is only the A and B genomes are coming from Norin 61 and lung. But right. if we cross with the, with the MDLs, we have opportunity also to, to increase the diversity in A and B genomes. So we crossed. We yeah. generated pentaploids and then we back cross these pentaploids with hexaploid. And so we who, just start this 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 just, activity. Okay. Yeah. 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 All right. Great. Um, so the next uh, question is from Veronique Viade, or Viade, again, sorry for a mispronunciation. Uh, how can you thresh such weeds to get the seeds? The MDL and the MSD are very easy to thresh because the genome is 75% is hexapractical varieties, marine 61, and 20, only 25% is coming from the from the wild species. So MDL and MSD are very easy to search. No, any huge wild uh, phenotype, if you are afraid from this, is very, very easy to search. No problem at all. OK. Uh, so the next question is from Elena Benavente. Uh, how can you know whether the enhanced performance of some MSD lines in response to a given stress is due to the Agilops tauchi alleles and not to alleles from the durum wheat accessions used to create the primary synthetics. Yeah, we, 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 during the, 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 the genome-wide association analysis, we could identify clearly because we have all these material genotype, the synthetic wheat is genotype, the langdon is genotype, the Agilops tauchi is genotype, and also the MSD is genotype. So we can know the source of each alleles. So during our analysis, if you need more details, you can go back to our publications. You can see clearly where we indicated that this allele is coming from the Gilops or Shai, or this is coming from Langdon, or coming from Norin 60. Yeah. OK, great. So what do you see as the greatest resource limitation for your research at this point? Hmm? What, what can you repeat again? What do you see as your greatest resource limitation? I mean, you've used quite a few different lines. Do you need more lines? Or what do you view as the greatest limitation in your research? Uh, so, the human resources. For no, example, not, the, oh, so human resources, yes, of course, <laughs> always. But from a genetic resource standpoint, yeah, what because. Do you see? conducting a lot of crosses and uh, uh, growing the material and making the crosses and, and advancing the populations uh, needs time, needs efforts of manpower, and also need yeah. resources like money, and need, need funds. But uh, maybe because at the beginning we just bulk the population, so it was easy to handle this material. And by genotyping, it is also very easy to understand the pedigree and know the source of each allele, where, where it came from. So, but the limitations, like other limitations of uh, normal breeding programs, man, manpower and uh, funds, yeah. these kinds of things. Yeah. yeah, well, funding is always a, a challenge, as, as well yes. as, man, you know, to have um, additional human resources available. Yes. Yes. Um, just curious, though, from your, from your standpoint of, uh, if if I remember correctly, it was 43 tau shy lines. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. So do you see, did you see much, um, I, I'm just curious if there was much diversity from a uh, breadth standpoint, or do you think that you're, you would have benefited much more if you had 100 tau shy lines? Yes. You would yes yeah. yes so the more diversity you add into your into your work will be yes. the better. yeah so that yes. would make sense to do you have plans to integrate additional lines at this at the at the at the, at the, at the, at the time point we don't have real plan to integrate additional lines but we had a plan to increase the level of of intercrossing between the MSD lines itself Okay. So because now you see the each line is coming from 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 from, from one family. So mm -hmm. and then 
maintained by self pollination. But if you can intercross these lines, maybe we can generate more diversity and we can generate more recombinations. And we try to do that, but uh, we have also some limitations here in Japan. We cannot introduce all uh, chemicals or doing this kind of things. And we were thinking to collaborate uh, with uh, our colleagues in ECARDA. They provided us with opportunity to grow this material in their fields and also spray with some chemicals. And then uh, that can induce male sterility. And then we can uh, collect the hybrid seeds. Maybe this can give us one round of intercrossing between the different lines that can also widen the diversity and also can increase the level of the recombination in the population. Maybe this also can increase the possibility or uh, resolution when we conduct mapping or genetic studies. Yes. So were the 43 lines that you used all uh, sequenced? The, were the genomes of, of all of them sequenced? We genotype. We cannot say sequencing, but we genotype all the 43 lines. And uh, yes, and these lines actually represent different uh, lineages of Yellowstone. For example, in these 43 lines, we have uh, 14 lines belong to lineage one, 25 lines belong to lineage two, and 24 lines belong to, and four lines belong to lineage three. Some lines from Iran, China, Turkey, Afghanistan, Georgia, Syria. Yeah. yeah it might be interesting. There's a, I think there's a new project in the in the United States and maybe even one in the UK where they are actually going through and sequencing, uh, doing full genome sequence, reference quality sequences of a number of lines. So it might be interesting to to compare your results with the genome sequenced lines. So you yeah. know, as it, as it moves forward. So the next question. Um, actually is do you share your seeds for testing virus resistance of course possible no problem just okay. contact us all right great um the next question comes from mariam nefzui uh, would it be possible to introgress the agilops tauchai genome into durham wheat for disease resistance this is interesting, very interesting question. You see that Durham wheat has A and B genomes. So introducing Egelofstoshai genome into Durham wheat, I cannot say that it is impossible. It is possible, but to what extent, I don't know. Have to try, very challenging. Uh, yes. Yeah, do you have any plans to try? Okay, so what I can say is that now we currently we don't have plan, but uh, in our laboratory we have uh, Dr. Takayoshi Ishii, my colleague. He's a cytogenetist or molecular cytogenetist. He's interested in wide hybridization, and uh, his interest is also to create new germplasm. And he's applying different advanced technologies to cross between the different wide relatives. And uh, he's doing a very great job and trying to use different technologies and different platforms to make it possible. Maybe one day he can make breakthrough and do this kind of mm, interesting. Yeah. And this kind of yes. Yeah, very interesting. So I'm gonna ask move to a a collaboration question because you're working with Sudan and try and you're working the climate there in Japan is not does not have the the same uh, temperature conditions that you have in Sudan. As you put together your collaboration and your, why did you pick Sudan or was, were there other opportunities or is, is, is Sudan, yes. like maybe you said Sudan was the, has the hottest temperatures. Mm. Yes. So, Sudan, not only for us, but Sudan, even for Simid and Icard, is considered one of the hottest spots for, 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 for phenotyping, for heat stress. And uh, for drought in Sudan, it is very easy for us because wheat is produced under irrigation, no rain. So we can, we can control the level of soil moisture in the field. Yeah. And also the saline soil is available. So everything was available in Sudan. And also, I said, as I said, I explained, also there is gradient the climate is down going from the north to the south those yeah. also make it make it easy but we have good relationship with our colleagues in civic 
also in Micarda, and right. they uh, kindly did some evaluation for these MSD lines for disease tolerance and also insect uh, tolerance. Yeah. So, but our collaboration with Sudan is, is unique, I would say. Yeah, yeah, it seems to be. Um, so I have a question uh, getting to the, the issue of the environment, both in Japan and in, in Sudan. Have you thought at all about uh, doing metagenomics of the soil to, in, in terms of the salinity to see if there's a impact from the microbes, both in terms of the salinity, in terms of the phosphorus and nit nitrogen use efficiency, which I know is is part of your plan. Yes, nitrogen use efficiency. Now the study is, uh, you can say that we finished our phenotyping, field phenotyping. And now our results. Now we are analyzing our data, and uh, we in collaboration here also in the Arid Land Research Center with our colleagues here in the, in the, in the laboratory of, of soil microbiology. They are also studying the microflora in Japan and also microflora in Sudan. So oh, this work right. now is really under. Yeah, that's very we are interesting. Welcome on that. Yes, yes. We are yeah, welcome on that. Very interesting. I, you know, I think that our capability now to bring in, you know, other aspects and other components to see yeah. the impact on the genetics is is really amazing at, at this point in time. It's a great time to be yeah, in. Actually, in the Arid Land Research Center, also we have very diverse uh, researchers and they have diverse disciplines, and mm -hmm. we can say that we are working in a nice harmony with each other. In this work, also the, uh, uh, we are collaborating with uh, with climatologist also is incorporated in this work, and they are also collecting data from our field because we would like to understand clearly the the interaction between the plant and the heat stress, exactly. the installing sensors, and this kind of things. So, yeah. well, I'm working on the team. results as it moves mm -hmm. forward. So, well, thank you, Yasar, particularly for staying up uh, very late uh, for you. <laughs> um, a good opportunity for me to talk to you today. Thank you very much for this invitation yeah. and for all attendees. Yeah. Well, we look forward to continuing to monitor your research. So, and thanks everyone for participating today. And uh, we look forward to seeing you when we restart our webinars in the fall. So, hope everyone has a good summer and we'll see you then. Thank you very much. Thank you.